Naya, welcome to Spirit Science Live. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm, I'm wonderful. I had a sweet, sunny morning and I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you here too because you're, I find that your work, uh, especially with like just the divine feminine, is really exploring a lot of that is, is so critically important for the world today, for, all of, for everybody to be talking about and exploring and, and with some of the movements and everything that's happening, you know, it's really important to explore just like the healing side of it too, and not just the, you know, calling out abuser side of things. And I, you know, that's really important. So, I mean, how would you begin like just to describe your work for anybody who's not familiar with you? How, how would you describe what it is that you do? Yeah. Ah, many ways to describe it. I like to liken it to shamanic psychology. Um, it's technically in the field of energy psychology, um, but I, it feels quite shamanic to me. <laughs> and basically what I'm able to do, I work with men and women, but primarily women, because that's, that's my expertise. Um, and what I'm able to do is basically access anyone's subconscious or energetic field. You could also call it the Akashic Records and basically find whatever is being held in the body, in the subconscious, in the energy field that is preventing us from being basically our embodied selves, um, fully embodying our purpose. And through that, I basically find, you know, lots of deep <laughs> core pieces that uh, that we've been holding and our ancestors have been holding for, for generations and, and for us for lifetimes. And that journey of the masculine feminine is, is a really relevant topic to that work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really beautiful. So is it more like you do kind of like uh, like a one-on-one -on -one coaching or is it, I mean, how do yeah, how do you work with people? Yeah, so, so it can take many forms. Um, I, I teach, so I work with students, and um, yes, yeah, so I work one-on-one, -on -one, and that can be remote um, from anywhere in the world. I have a really international client base, which is amazing, and I'm so grateful for. And, and so that's beautiful, and then I also really like to host, you know, group healings and workshops to really heal that rift um, because it's it's really important I feel to heal individually but it always has to land interpersonally as well so I think it's also really important to gather as groups women with women and men with women as well so that that healing can also transfer to um, our, our relationships all, all forms of them mm, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I mean, that, that's, that's really beautiful too. Like being able to connect both. Yeah. Like individually, collectively kind of bringing people together. Um, I mean, when you talked about, you just said like, you know, healing that rift, I, I assume I, I, that you're kind of speaking about the rift between like just the masculine energy and the feminine energy. Is that right? Yes. And that can also just be within oneself. Basically what we've been seeing is an imbalance of masculine feminine energy. Um, you know, within and without on um, the individual and the collective level. And so a lot of our healing is coming back into balance. And you could also see it, you know, the right and the left brain. So really coming into balance so that we are able to utilize the divine aspects of both and really transform the, uh, let's say, imbalance or more wounded aspects of both masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. What do you think the most important thing is for, like, for, for, for starting that journey, for, like, getting into that, doing that work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I find that there's, there's a lot of different steps, but the, the reason why I'm, I'm so passionate about doing the work on the subconscious level is because there's so much underneath you know, the surface that we don't see that is really affecting our lives. You know, 95% of our behavior stems from the subconscious level. 
And the subconscious is processing millions of bits of information per second when our conscious mind is only processing five to nine bits. So it's, it's massive and there's a lot there, you know, whether it's um, from this lifetime, from our ancestry or from past lives um, or parallel lives, if you believe in that. And so, you know, for me, if we are going to tap into the power that we've been disconnected from or that we forgot or that was um, sort of traumatized out of us, you know, it's, it's important to really recognize where did that come from and to honor that journey and the emotions that, that came from that original separation or that original, you know, disconnect from from our truth or from our power or from our connection to source so for me it's it's really about um shadow work is kind of it's pretty key in my book and and i'm also a proponent that it doesn't have to be you know scary or hard or long and, and drawn out that there's a way to really honor that and do the shadow work um but but actually enjoy the process yeah. hmm. that does sound interesting because sometimes looking at the shadow isn't necessarily easy right like it can be difficult to face that and I, a lot of the experiences that I've had in that field kind of happen you, often with like the help of plant medicine, especially like ayahuasca, like going to Rhythmia and doing those, you know, doing those ceremonies. Um, but even just having that, like, you know, that one-on-one, -on -one, I think being able to, to go inside of yourself is just so valuable. I mean, like, I guess are all of your, your, your work is always just like through communication, right? It's not, uh, have you ever had any, any work with the plant medicine in that same way? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, plant medicine is a huge ally. Um, I really respect it. I really honor it. And I do um, welcome it into my life at, at certain times. Um, and it's, it's been a great ally for me. I have worked with it um, with clients in, in small portions. And that's just because if you have a short window of time, with somebody, you know, the, the plant medicine and, and allies can open these, these portals um, so beautifully and so quickly as long as you're um, really tuning into the perfect dosage and timing and, and not overdoing it. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I actually, especially, so your, your question is interesting about communication because there, there is a way that I can work with people um, more shamanically in person that is more the kinesthetic channel where the body is just doing all this clearing of energy and the plant medicines can open that gateway um, really beautifully. But I'm, I'm really a big, um, I, I really advocate for using them responsibly um, in the right containers with the right people, uh, asking your body what dosage and if it's the right time for you and, and mm. not overdoing that. Yeah, I really respect that. Definitely. Uh, I feel the same way. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious too, like, you know, on your, your website here too, just like kind of where you are introducing yourself, you're talking about, you know, every woman has something that ignites her, a deep feminine fire. And when I saw that initially, I was, you know, I, I kind of wanted to ask you, how that would relate like for a man who sees that you know is that also could you relate that with something that's inside of a man or would you say that that's sort of there's like a feminine energy a feminine experience exclusively for women yeah that's a good question uh, I think it's both and. I think absolutely, <laughs> you know, it brings me back to the conversation. I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well. Um, mm. of the fact that we, we both have masculine and feminine energy. And the imbalance of the masculine has really brought us as a whole into living life from the mind and from the outside in and seeking that approval and, and sort of just living from the left side of the brain. And I think that men and women can both relate to that. And, you know, as a society, what we're doing is awakening to listening to the intuition, the creativity, the passion, you know, healing the sexual energy so that we can be in balance and basically be guided. I think this is, this is the key that, that I really feel is that we are meant to receive. So feminine is receive if you look at the female anatomy. 
you know, her, she's receptive, right? Whereas the male anatomy is more, you know, assertive. And so in my eyes, we're really meant to connect in with the feminine energy to receive the guidance, to really um, be in that surrender to the greater purpose to the greater pulse that is you know guiding all of us and then to use the masculine energy to really um create and to express that in the world so i think it applies to both men and women um i think a lot of women are, are being called to work specifically with women right now because that feminine um energy on the planet has been so suppressed and distorted yeah, definitely. I, I feel for myself, you know, just because you kind of presenced earlier too, like, um, I, well, I've been really exploring this a lot lately and kind of connecting with the, the divine feminine, the Christ Sophia energy and that consciousness. And even going as far as like, I've, I'm just in the middle of reading the women who run with wolves, uh, which I, I'm really finding a lot of value in and connecting with it, right? And just relating the stories even though the book is very written, like, you know, as a woman, you should, you know, you should know this or that. And, and I'm like, okay, I can, I, you know, the part of me that's got the feminine inside, I'll like, let me tune into that. You know, let me like, let me feel that. And I feel like also that in, in most ways, if a man really wanted to, they could really relate with that divine feminine consciousness. And I think maybe in only maybe some ways, and I, I, there's still, I don't even know all that I don't know, um, but there's. There, I feel like there are some ways that it's still difficult for men and women to relate. And I, I can say specifically, you know, even just like moon cycles is, you know, that's not something that I have that biological experience of, unless I suppose like, you know, I tap into maybe it's like past lives or something like that. Maybe I can connect with it through that. Um, so I feel like, yeah, like it, the communication, the ability to be sensitive, even just tuning into your feminine energy for, for, for men and women to, to use that to relate to each other, to feel each other is one of the most valuable things that we can do then in bridging that gap and like healing that rift between the, the, the energies. Yeah, totally. I fully agree. Yeah. yeah, and I think listening is key right now because we both have unique experiences and perspectives um, and, and we both have wisdom, deep inherent wisdom, and we both, and speaking to the genders, and we both have wounding that we've inherited, um, you know, from, from our cultures. So I think that um, one of the biggest things I, I really feel so deeply is that that compassion to be able to really listen to one another's experience um, with with deep compassion and our our best attempt at understanding as as much as we can. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's like just I mean feeling and even sometimes just being like you know even as far as this podcast goes and just conversations in general, often we, we have that um, desire to fill the space with something, fill the, you know, to communicate, to always be, be talking. But sometimes like the more is said in silence than, than even when you're communicating with words. Right. It's like, I mean, would you say that then, you know, what, like a, a part of the, the work that, that I've done in spirit science and, and what we explore often is sort of developing like intuitive or psychic abilities, you know, just like connecting with your more psychic senses um, and being able to interpret and extract information from visions and meditations and dreams and all of that. And, and, and I mean, do you feel, I guess it's maybe it's a self-explanatory answer in a way, but do you feel like the, like the, the development of psychic and intuitive abilities is in direct relationship to how much work you do with the feminine energy? That's a cool question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that, again, it comes to that interplay and, and what you're really doing, it, it sounds like, and I'm, I'm just going to assume that the masculine energy, what, what you're doing is setting up sort of a structure and you're creating the space for that, um, for to be able to receive 
And, and yes, I do feel that that receptive energy is more that feminine energy in the right side of the brain. You'll see when, you know, we're tapping into our intuition and, and things like that, we are tap, you know, the, the right side of the brain is lighting up. Um, so I would say absolutely. But again, that's, that's an energy that we all have and we're all really meant to be in balance with. So I think it's, it's wonderful and, and beautiful and we all have that ability and sometimes it's just about relearning how to do that. Yeah, definitely. It, you reminded me of, um, there was a, another podcast I was listening to once, which was uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talking with a neuroscientist. Uh, and it was interesting because, you know, I, I was mostly tuning in because I was like, I'm curious what Neil deGrasse Tyson thinks about psychedelics. And he, he had that as li- one of the tags of what they talked about with the, you know, the neuroscientist uh, woman. And uh, during that same podcast, what, what she explained, what the, the scientist explained was that uh, men predominantly utilize or think more on the left side of the brain. They're using more of that left brain mentality and that women generally use a bit of both and they described you know she tried to describe sort of like the pros and cons of each and I just found it to be so interesting that like the you know the perspective that she took was that's the way it is rather than that looks and feels like it might be out of balance you know like like why aren't men a little bit more balanced is that you know is that is it supposed to be like that for what purpose is it like that um, and it also made me wonder, like, what would happen if someone was almost entirely on the right side, you know, like, it, you know, is that, is that getting into like, just being like, so out there that, you know, no one will understand you or just, or like deeply psychic, but you lack the communication ability to relate it. Like, I don't know. Um, but I like the, the you know, just this general relationship of just even for, for, for men and everybody just striving for that harmony between the two. Yeah, agreed. And and my prayer is also that, you know, the more that we do that, the more that will be reflected in our systems as well. Um, you know, in our in our politics and our economics and our educational system that it's it can really honor um, the aspects of the feminine and, and support, you know, the deeper purpose that is, um, you know, wanting to live through all of us instead of, you know, over um, structuring everything and it really kills the spirit yeah yeah well and and i mean just even not acknowledging the spirit right like that's i think maybe one of the consequences of having this this materialistic worldview that like everything that you see is all there is period there's no spirit there's no soul there's no right like that is maybe even one of the roots of our of our greatest disconnection as a species right yeah. Um, cause it's, it's, it's an experience directly. Like well, the moment you acknowledge it and you start, you know, trying to feel it, you start to experience it and it becomes real for you. If you say it doesn't exist, then, then your body also just says, sure enough, it doesn't exist, you know? Sort of going back to our, our beliefs create our reality. And, you know, to me, I, I feel like it, it directly relates to just using such a small part of our brain because, you know, people that are accessing their parapsychological abilities are accessing more of their brain. And it's not woo-woo. Like, these, this is where science and spirit are slowly starting to merge because, you um, these things can be tangible. Um, our, our technology is just sort of growing to, to understand that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're, we're really at the, at the beginning of a new frontier, it seems. Um, uh, like, it's where spiritual sciences can actually start to uh, change the way that we're thinking, right? Because it's like, as scientists have this collective worldview of the way things are, but like, with every new discovery, it's starting to like challenge that perspective. And soon it's just becoming like a tidal wave. That's going to, I mean, it, it, there's really no stopping it unless people just stop doing research, but I don't, don't really look, doesn't look like that's going to happen. Right. Yeah. So that's really beautiful. Yeah, um, how is, um, so how is this whole quarantine thing being for you? Has it been like, um, ha- have there been a lot of revelations and things that came up for you as a part of this, like as a part of your work and everything, or like, what have you experienced from, from your vantage point about COVID and quarantine and kind of the earth changes we're going through? 
Yeah. Woo. That's a big question. <laughs> I'd be curious to hear for you as well. Um, for me, in terms of lifestyle, it hasn't changed too much. Um, I get to work from home, and so that's been great. I've still been able to just continue that. And I do miss going out to really nice dinners. <laughs> that's one of my favorite things to do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically my psychic abilities have expanded and I've heard that from a lot of people and I've heard from a lot, a lot of people that they, some, some people that have done a lot of inner work and have really prepared for this time have actually been doing better than ever. And this time has really catalyzed their inner sense of leadership. Um, their inner fire to get their gifts out because they're seeing so much distortion and, and fear-based programs in the world. And so I think I can really relate to that where I just feel, you know, more passionate about what I'm doing and more excited to get it out there. Um, so I think for me, it's been a positive catalyst. And the only key thing for me is, has been to really keep a balance uh, in regards to how much I'm doing the 3D research on what's going on. Um, you know, not just in COVID, but, you know, the, the deeper um, roots of, of what we're seeing. And so, you know, focusing on that can be um, intense and it can take a drain on on the physical emotional energetic bodies so i think when it first started i, I dove really deep into so much research um and then i really had to pull it back and and really focus on on my work and self-care and and all of that mm -hmm. when you say research like what specifically were you exploring <laughs> uh, <sighs> Yeah, this is always like, you know, how deep do I go into that? Because um, there's... You go as deep as you want to, as, as, as much as you're comfortable with, at least. Yeah, well, there's, there's rabbit holes upon rabbit holes when it comes to that research. But basically, it's, for me, it's a balance of the research. You know, what's going on? Who's doing what? Why are they doing it? And mm. how is that affecting us? And then there's, you know, tapping into the higher guidance of like, okay, that's insane. And what's true for me? And, right. and, you know, what, it, what am I being able to, to do? What's the higher perspective here? So, again, there's that balance. Um, but for me, you know, I really, I really was researching more about um, who, who is doing what and why and what they have shown us um, uh, very clearly throughout the years in regards to their – intentions um their plans um their values and and things like that so um i feel quite clear on on my perspective on what's what's happening wow that's exciting because i didn't know that we'd be getting uh into like conspiracy stuff on this on this call <laughs> but but now all i have to ask is okay who's 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 doing what <laughs> based on your research based on your perspective like what you know this was something i'll just preface with this i brought this up uh in a, our spirit circle which is like a, a spirit science a spirit mysteries gathering with our mystery school last night and i asked the group um like about this whole you know hoaxed alien attack uh idea that's been floating around since werner von braun the nazi scientist kind of revealed it and everything like that and then there's that and then combined with the Pentagon releasing all of this like alien stuff, uh, you know, in this last year, it's just been like, Oh, we found a craft. And it's like, you, you've had it forever, but okay. But like the, 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 the response that I got from the community was really good. And, and one, one of my friends, um, Patrick, he shared this like really beautiful perspective of like, it's not one specific agenda and that's controlling everything. It's like everybody's got an agenda. There's agendas upon agendas and they're all kind of competing for each other. And some are positive, some are negative. There's a lot of, it's just kind of like this mess. Yeah. And, uh, and I just kind of wanted to preface that by, before, you know, kind of really op you know, opening the floor up here because this has the potential to go deep and it's going to be really fun. I know it. But, um, but I mean, what did you find out of all of your research? You know, COVID was made in a lab. Like where, 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 would that, where did that happen? <laughs> Going straight for it. Well, I'm still calibrating, you know, what I want to share. But what I, I will preface this with is um, that the guidance that I've been shown is really that we have 
as a collective, right? Because everyone's on their own trajectory um, vibrationally. But as a collective, we basically um, pass beyond the third dimension. So we are actually, um, you know, on our way to 5D, but we're kind of in 4D right now. And 4D is, is sort of like this cosmic battle, you know, where everything's being accelerated, where basically the awakening is almost, it's almost at that tipping point so that the beings that are invested in control and fear-based programming to keep that control are basically heightening, you know, their, their endeavors to maintain that sense of control. Um, and so, what I've been shown is that this, this is actually a really chaotic, confusing time where it just inherently is going to be really hard to navigate what's true, what's not true, um, because there's actually, right now, there's actually dark and light kind of in everything, and it's all being amplified, and timelines are shifting very quickly. So no matter what I'm researching or finding, it's like I'm taking it in all with a grain of salt and releasing it and tapping into also just a greater vision. You know, what are we here to create? And ultimately, the other piece that I've I've been shown is that whatever it is, whatever the story is, whatever they're doing, it's all a distraction from the fact that this time has been prophesized about by many ancient cultures. We are in an awakening and, you know, there are beings that don't want that to happen because they're not going to be in control anymore, um, you know, as we find our power. So, so that's sort of the overarching view that, that I'm holding is um, no matter what it is, like timelines can shift and I want to just keep coming back to what am I here to create, keep building that, keep connecting with community, um, and keep really moving towards the, the greater vision that we all have. Wow. You know, you, you have the potential to pop a lot of conspiracy theorists' bubbles with that speech, and I love it. I actually think that's really valuable to be like, Yes, there's all these like physical things we could focus on and control things, but like, what's the bigger picture? And how, you know, looking at it from energy and just saying <laughs> that's a distraction and being able to look at something else is, I think that's, there's some value in that, being able to like kind of just refine in the nature of the conversation. Um, so, and when you said like we're shifting timelines, w would you say that would be the, like the reason why there's so many Mandela effects popping up all uh over the place? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Well, first, I just want to preface that I think it's both and. I actually think that um, you can easily bypass, like, you know, some of the 3D concrete things that are going on that are mm. good to really prepare for, protect yourself from, or, or be aware about. Um, right. So I just wanted to, but I, instead of going straight into all the, you know, those specifics, um, I wanted to preface it with, you know, the my overarching intention. Um, mm. So... So yeah, with shifting, you know, it's funny. I, I've been, I'm curious what, which Mandela effects you're tracking because I know about that phenomenon. I've researched some of them years ago and I think recently I was just wondering about, um, there was a couple that I was like, I wonder if that's one. So I'm curious if there's any that you're tracking recently. <laughs> um, well, I, I went down deep into that um, probably like a month or two ago or just kind of got caught up, I guess, because I'd heard about it many years ago, you know, especially like, I think the Berenstein Bears was the biggest one. Um, <laughs> uh, but the late, lately, um, I like, it was actually, it was last, I'm sorry, which one? The Star Wars one. That's the one that got me. Which, oh, like the, I am your father versus like, he doesn't say Luke, I'm your father. He says, no, I'm your father. Yeah. 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 Um, no, that's, that's, that's definitely one. Um, the other that really got my team, I was on a, a team, like a call with my team last month and, uh, and, and we just started talking about, you know, Mandela effects. And I said, Hey guys, really quickly, how do you spell Looney Tunes? And they were like, you know, Looney T O O N S. And I'm like, apparently not. And like, I, I had like three or four members being like, what? No, no, hold on. And they all started like looking it up and, and it's like tunes, like music, like T U N E S. And, and, it was just, it was pandemonium in the chat for like, I don't know, 10 minutes of people just being like, how is this 
how is this possible? You know, it's like it, nobody remembers it being that way. So there's, I mean, there's a lot though, like to really go into them. And I just, I mean, that's a really, I like that idea, at least as far as a possible explanation goes, it's like certainly everyone could just be crazy and remembering things wrong. But I think it really resonates with the idea of like that shifting timelines and um, what you described about moving into the, uh, uh, from the third dimension to the fifth dimension, we're in this kind of crazy in between time. That is actually exactly what, what Drumvelo told me uh, back in, well, actually, no, I think the interview was in like 2016, but we taught, we were talking about 2012 and he was saying that, um, that in the 2012 shift, there was this window actually it was between like 2011 and 2015 or something like that. There's this, this big time window where, um, we kind of stepped into a higher reality. However, we were not ready to get to this dimensional shift level where we could, you know, um, be these, you know, multidimensional, formless, shapeless, you know, manifest your thoughts and feelings instantly kind of beings, uh, because there was still a lot of darkness inside of us. And that if we, you know, instantly were shifted into a reality where our thoughts and feelings would manifest, it would just be like this crazy demonic explosion of us eating ourselves from the inside out, I guess. I don't know, this energy explosion or whatever. So, um, so that in that transition, what happened was that uh, a sort of artificial third dimensional construct was created around us and that like we are sort of in a, a false or a pretend 3D environment going into a higher frequency and then that it's like that reality is starting to break apart or breaking or, or starting to shift as we heal, as we evolve and grow, then we gain more and more control over the higher dimensional frequencies that are like kind of trapped within us or just all of the energies in, in, in all of creation and become more conscious creators. But we have to put in the work and do the healing and do the, you know, all of that in order to get there. And so uh, that really, that really kind of, kind of just resonates, just resonate. re resonates yeah. and brings everything together, I think. Yeah, hmm. absolutely. I haven't heard that, but nothing would surprise me at this point. <laughs> I feel like the more I learn, the it's all crazy. It reminds me to, of, um, I was in a, um, a part of this really beautiful women's group and were very visionary in the vision. And at one point, and at one point, we, well, the night before we had been talking about, you know, all of the agendas going on and the pedophilia and um, the Luciferianism. And at one point during the ceremony, one of the women said, um, we need to heal and release any and everything within ourselves that um, is like a microcosm or, or, you know, an aspect of that. And, you know, at first glance, it's like, I could never, like, I don't have any of that in me. Like, that, that's sick and I can't, I can't relate to it. And, um, and so, you know, she's like, release anything that inside of you that wants a slave, right? And, you know, in my mind, I start going through, like, the clothes that we're wearing and the technology we're on and, like, so much of our lifestyle is built on some aspect of practical slavery. Um, and yeah, so this is a whole longer conversation, but, but it's interesting to, to do that deeper healing, not just for ourselves, but also for the collective and, and take responsibility that we are all connected. And on some higher level, we are choosing this reality where, you know, we are signing up for um, the lessons in duality. Um, and so we're not, we're not victims to this experience. So anyway, it just made me think of that. Mm. I mean, I mean, that has the potential to go really dark there too, because that's like the, you know, the pedophilia and stuff coming out um, and that like global awareness around it and the control systems is just, I mean, there was, um, I don't know if you know who Eric Weinstein is. He's like a scientist and scholar guy, but he's actually fairly brilliant. But he, what he was saying that was that like we tripped over something, you know, it's like the, the, like the Epstein case and everything like that really coming out and actually like blowing up and being big. It's like, that's just like one tiny thing of a much bigger 
issue and control thing that that's really going on. And, um, you know, what you're saying of like every aspect of, of what we're, I mean, what does the world look like free of all of this stuff? Like we don't even know, we don't have a, a frame of reference of a world that doesn't have slavery built into it or, uh, apparently pedophilia, which is really gross to think about. Um, and something has to be done, you know? I mean, I, I, and, and I, you know, honor to what you said before of just like how it's like, yes, it's all energy, but let's not spiritually bypass the other side of the coin of like the, what's actually physically happening because it's, you know, it's a very, it's a big issue. And maybe it's one of those things where the more that we, I mean, even collectively heal this stuff and bring to justice, you know, what's, you know, the, the, the atrocities that are going on um, that will actually be able to, you know, that, handling that collectively will lead to the sort of enlightenment that we're looking for on the other side and that feeling of connection and wholeness. And that it's like that direct relationship of that energy is actually causing us more separation. But it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's so difficult to, I mean, on, on the one hand, it's like the conversation of the pedophilia, I think it's fairly, uh, most people, except for probably insane people can look at that and go, you know, that's wrong, you know, and we can, we can collectively agree on that. So that's really good. Um, but on the other side, like the conversation of feminism, of equality of the sexes, you know, like that one gets shut down, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so it's like, where are we on the spectrum of human consciousness? Like why, why, why can we not see that equality of the sexes or just like harmony, like being able to listen to each other? Why can we not see that that's a good idea? You know? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's just like, I'm just seeing this battle of all these different perspectives and, and like the clashing of, of all of them. Um, and it's scary, you know, they're trying to make um, pedophilia an actual uh, sexual orientation um, now and, and basically they stigmatize it. It's, it's scary for sure. But the interesting thing is I, th- I think that it, it's actually really related. I feel like the, the suppression and the distortion of that divine feminine sacred energy, which is inherently also sexual energy, creative energy, that innocence has, has been so distorted that, you know, naturally it's going to, um, come out in weird and distorted ways, you know, through traumatizing one another, through, um, through violation and, and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think it's connected. And in regards to that conversation, you know, one thing I've, I've been, you know, I'm, I'm still learning about all this myself and I'm, I'm pondering it every day, you know, and I have a unique perspective because, um, you know, I'm, holding women's wounds and, and yonis on a daily basis and releasing these things that have been held there throughout thousands of years. And, you know, I'm seeing things that were not recorded in history um, and, and how prevalent it is, for example, to have women's fathers, you know, violate them sexually and how many times the priestess temples were, um, were burned down and all the, you know, divine priest, sexual priestesses were, were raped or, you know, they were turned into brothels. And, um, you know, so I'm holding this, you know, collective history and, and seeing the, the absolute power of the feminine, you know, we used to create earthquakes, with the amount of Shakti that our bodies would be conduits for. We are divine conduits for that energy. And that is threatening. That is threatening to any male energy that is still wanting to dominate or to control. And so it's like that eternal, and this has been going on many planets, millions of years. It's like, you know, it, it's, it's been happening for a really long time. And so I think what my point is here, I think it's easy to ignore if you're really focusing on the surface level of things and you're going, oh, okay, maybe women aren't paid as much or, you know, women are objectified in society. Like, okay, anyone can kind of like see that. But if you're actually tapping in to the true power of your soul and the history of your soul, and the true power of the feminine essence, and that is, includes man. You know, when you are making love with a woman and she's letting you into that deepest, most spiritual divine place, and you're able to access the divine and have like 
full energetic cosmic orgasms and unity with God because of her womb being that portal to spirit, like that's good for men too. <laughs> like it's, you know, that is a wonderful thing if you're not threatened by it, if you can surrender to that power. And so my, my point here is when you start to access the deeper potential power and wisdom and capacity of the feminine, you start seeing that everything in society is designed to suppress it. And so it's like on the surface, people might not understand the masculine feminine patriarchy. It might not seem like a big deal. Like I was sitting in the back of my women's studies group in college, rolling my eyes, being like, we're free. We can do whatever we want. Oh no. When you tap into the true power, the true power, you realize that this world is set up to totally squash it. <laughs> so yeah, just, just some passionate feelings about that. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. That like, that, that, that was so intense that like sent me into a trance of just like <laughs> feeling the intensity of your words and the, the, the emotion and the meaning there, especially. And I think that's, that's very interesting, even on like the, you know, people often compare, as you described, you know, it's just the physical thing and looking at things physically, like men generally have, you know, stronger bodies, not dissing, you know, female bodybuilders or anything like that. But the, the general thing is, you know, men are sometimes taller and have more muscles and this and that. So there's that, there's that stereotype of like men are more powerful. It's like, well, women can create earthquakes and be super psychic. So, you know, maybe there's a bit of a, <laughs> like a trade off there in that. Um, but that, I mean, wow, that was really very moving. All I could say is just like, thank you. Um, for bringing that energy to this, to the table here in this conversation. Um, I mean, what do you say to people who don't get that? Pe pe people who maybe even don't even have the capacity to hear or feel what you are describing? Yeah, that's a really relevant question right now that I'm exploring in my own personal life because I have been around people that, that really don't understand that. And that's why I appreciate so much people like you that are, you have created that space to really receive the transmission and to listen and to be curious. And not everybody is. Um, and so, you know, I think that I work with a lot, a lot with shame and um, shame is like the sneaky energy that, um, you know, is hard to identify because it'll come out in different ways. But basically, both men and women have suppressed shame, and, but they're typically for different things. And I do feel that um, we can have suppressed shame for the ways that we have actually um, suppressed ourselves or other people, again, past life, it could be ancestral, that can prevent us from seeing truly, um, it's like we're, we're afraid, we're afraid to see our own shadow. And so a lot of people can be in denial about, you know, what's really going on and, and what's created it and what's going to help get us out of it. So I don't have that answer, but I do feel like something that feels really important to me is to create space for um, the pain of the oppressed. And that also includes, you know, you know, black people and, and other people to be heard so that we can create deeper understanding. And, and that's why I'm ordering books such as, you know, right, white fragility and, and things like that, because it's, if you're in a place of privilege, it's hard to know, um, you know, it's, and it can be um, hard to face too. Um, <laughs> so I think that that's important. If people can have the humility to, to just listen, that's really going to start creating um, a deeper understanding and healing for both sides. I'm really happy you brought that up. Um, especially just like the privilege part that was really big for me. Um, maybe it was two years ago now or so. I, I don't know. It's probably in and around two years ago. Um, I listened to the audiobook for uh, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. And I had never, actually, it was just like, it wasn't that I was closed minded before then to that information. It was just that I had never been exposed to it and I never yeah. was introduced to it. So it was, I was living in a bubble of seeing that, that really that white privilege and especially being a man 
a, a white male, I'm like, shit, like, th- like, I didn't even know. And how do I change now that I just learning to be more sensitive and more empathic towards uh, everybody, right? And like trying to see things a little bit differently. Because I would, I mean, my natural, I feel like state of looking at people is I, I generally look to see the best in everybody anyways, or try to and, and evoke that within them in conversations and stuff like that. But having like a, the ability to have a deeper respect for the, the way that people have been treated, right? Like, and that was another thing I just never really related with because, the, you know, outside of trolls on the internet and bullies in school, which I assumed was sort of a thing that everyone dealt with, I didn't see the larger overarching like structures of hierarchy and stuff like that. And that was, that was just really big for me. So, I mean, I mean we've even like with Spirit Science, you know, we, we have planned episodes about this kind of thing, um, including uh, well, we did one called War and Spirituality, which was really exploring, you know, after the protests and the riots and everything, um, you know, spirituality and war and a little bit of like racism and stuff. But um, we even have like a, a planned episode for feminism and that kind of thing to to break into that because I, I do think like it's just at the very least conversations that need to be had. He, he, even if people are like very resisting, it's better to have that conversation than to just shut it out entirely i think um yeah. to to get the energy moving to get the conversation happening so i guess on that too i'm like i'm really grateful to be able to have this conversation with you about this because this is it's needed yeah i so agree and I'm, I'm so grateful to hear that that you're creating that space and it is really it's um i think we are in that space right now of the revealing like we're, we're seeing it all we're seeing the the darkness yeah. and and you know and i think also a part of um i think it was amazing you know with the me too movement you know women really got to have a voice and and share what they went through um but i think a, a deeper part of that is you know okay you got violated but how did that affect you you know, how did that change your life? And what have you been dealing with since then? And I think that's that's a conversation around the, the pedophilia as well is, um, you know, a lot of these people think that they're not hurting these young beings and they're just sharing love. Um, but why don't we start having the conversations of, you know, be, you know, and I can speak for myself, um, you know, having a violation at age five, like how that changed, um, you know, the, the course of my life after. And I think it's, it's beautiful that you're humble. It, it takes so, so much humility to, um, to step back, you know, and to just listen to the pain. Um, I remember when I was, um, I went to the festival beloved one year and, um, I wasn't able to sleep. And usually when that happens, there's a spirit that wants to talk to me. So I, I said, okay, what's, what's going on? And there was this, um, native American chief on the land. And, um, I said, okay, what, you know, what's, what's up? What do you want? And he's <laughs> like, you didn't, you didn't make an offering, you know, better. And, and I do know better actually, you know, to, to make offerings to land. If, if you're coming, you know, to a sacred land and taking or, or, you know, doing something on the land, you want to honor the land and the ancestors. So, um, so I made an offering the next day and before bed, you know, I, I tapped in and just asked, okay, like, are you, are you satisfied? Is that, is that enough? Do you feel honored? And he said, no. And he said, I want you to look in my eyes and I want you to see the pain. And, you know, I just felt this like wave of fear in my system, you know, like, oh God. Um, but I knew, like I knew I've actually been through that pain in, in past lives. I, I get it. I know. And, um, you know, I also do deep trauma work with people and the deepest way to heal trauma. And I watch, I track it in people's bodies. Sometimes a hundred traumas can go in one session. And that's because there's space to process it, to be seen and heard in a safe way. And so I looked in his eyes and he just transmitted the pain through his eyes. And I, I respected it. I received it. And he ended up giving me a smoke blessing, like, um, some tobacco he was like blowing into my heart and over my shoulders and, and gave me a blessing. And, and that's the healing, you know, is, is when we can be humble enough to, to listen and then to come together to strategize how to get out of this mess together. Wow. Well, and, and, and just bringing it all back here to the feminine of receiving, like you, 
humbling yourself, opening yourself to this, this, this Native American and just receiving from them is what, it's almost as if, you know, it's like that was a masculine uh, push or a masculine energy that you just had to open to receiving. And then the moment that it, it actually connected with you, it alchemized into something new and birthed yeah. something new within you. And that's, that's a really beautiful thing. Like, I, I think maybe in the, <laughs> how, how do you describe it? The staunch firmness of the masculine mindset sometimes can, can lead to, it's like the, it's like the parable of the full cup. You know, it's like, when you think you know everything already, then there's no room for anything new to come in. But when nothing new can come in, nothing can alchemize, nothing can shift and change. So you're stuck with this mindset for, for so long. And evolution happens when you empty your cup, when you allow yourself to receive something greater and something bigger, right? Um, or just something more, so another perspective, another feeling, someone else's heart, you know, when they share it with you. And, um, and I, I personally kind of relate this directly to growth. It's like, you know, when you see someone who, you know, maybe only grows this much over their, over their whole lives versus someone who's just on a rapid ascent of growth, it always seems to be that one of the biggest differences is the ability to be humble and to listen and learn, right? Because when you say, I don't even know all that I don't know, you suddenly open yourself up to, to growing so much more because you're actively taking in all this stuff. And you're like, oh yeah, I... I, I heard about that once. I know everything there is to know about it. Like that perspective stops you from ever taking in anything new. Yeah, totally. I was so passionate about this like a day or two ago. I just put a post on it that true mastery is, is humility. And it's, it's like the, there's an infinite, I mean, we're, we're constantly growing as souls. Um, and and that the wisdom of the feminine is that nonlinear infinite space. And, you know, the more that we're growing, the more that we're expanding into new areas, meaning we're, we're new. We're, we're always babies in, in some process. And I think that the more we can be humble enough to, um, to recognize our humility, the more we can access that greater power. And I think some of the most spiritually masterful people are absolutely the most humble people, period, um, because they're not, um, they're not coming from ego. And yeah, I, I'm so passionate about that. Mm. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. awesome. That's good. I mean, I don't even know what else there is. We're <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess just jumping back to some of the things that we've been talking about, you know, conspiracies and the shifting of times and COVID and everything like that. Like, what do you see as the kind of the outcome, I guess, like, like one year from now, five years from now, like, like, what do you think things are going to look like? Um, after all of this changes, you know, also adding into that, like you described, you know, we're kind of in this period of an apocalypse of the, like the lifting of the veil. We're seeing everything with such clarity or, or more clarity anyways. Um, like this is probably going to be a pretty messy shift of ages, isn't it? <laughs> so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I honestly feel in that we're in, pure possibility, pure potential right now. And that on some level, it really is up to us to continue the work, meaning the inner work, vibrational work and, and protecting our vibrational fields, but also creating, creating that which we want to see and, and not putting that on pause. Um, so I think that as long as we are able to work through the fear programs and continue to gather in whatever way we can and create this, the, you know, we all have a puzzle piece of the new systems, you know? Um, and so as long as we're saying yes to that in whatever way we can in each moment, I think that this will be 
a massive catalyst for awakening. I think that some beings are show, showing their true colors and it's awakening people that weren't awake before. And there's, there's a tidal wave happening. So I'm wanting to be as positive as possible that even if it looks like it's getting worse at some points um, or there's scary things going on, um, that it cannot all be a catalyst um, for the great revealing and for the great you know, rebuilding of, of something new. And one piece of guidance I got from my guides was that everyone you know, um, to control or also backfiring and totally creating the opposite of what they're wanting. Um, so it's, it's, that, that even if things look insane, that, you know, we are rising to the occasion and creating something new, ultimately. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how messy it's going to be. I don't know how long it's going to take. I think that, you know, different people might experience totally different things. Like the world could be going insane. And I've had moments where I felt like I'm in heaven. And, and in paradise while the world is crumbling. Um, and then I'm sure vice versa, you know, where things might look great on the outside, but someone's, you know, having their inner dark night of the soul. So I think it's, it's individual um, as well. Yeah. No, that's, that's really well said, I think. And maybe we can take like the, the mantra from the ayahuasca ceremonies, or at least the one like at Rhythmia, they say this a lot, and I've heard this before, but it's that um, what's coming is going. And so, you know, when things are coming up, you know, whether it's in a ceremony or for yourself or for the collective, you know, it's, it's a drudging up of something that has to be released, but it can't be released unless we face it. And so even the really, you know, heavy, nasty stuff, the pedophilia and the rape and the abuse and all of this stuff, you know, it has to come up for us to see it. And, and even like, Jeez, I mean, um, being a you know a YouTuber myself, you know, on the la in the last month, things exploded with some really high level YouTubers all kind of getting these accusations, and then everything started coming out. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with Shane Dawson, um, but he, he's he was considered for a while being like like the face of YouTube or being like one of the like the most watched person on YouTube. Now maybe not as much as PewDiePie, I don't know, but either way, he's up there like post a video, 10 million views, day one kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and then all of this stuff started coming up with like really nasty videos of him that he just, he just, they were just all up on YouTube from like years and years ago of him just being kind of a pedophile. And it's gross. And it was just like, wow, I hadn't, I didn't even, I had no idea. I only learned about him because of, he was making conspiracy videos and talking about Mandela effects and stuff. And I was like, Oh, this, this is great. You know, like I didn't, I had no idea. Um, but it's just like a domino effect. It's like one after the other, um, this kind of stuff is coming out and, and I, I don't know, people are getting canceled, you know, in, in, in the la mass sort of social sphere as things are. And a lot of scandals are coming out. And I think ultimately that's like a really good, I, I think it needs to happen. And, um, the, the one part that, you know, that I'm looking at too is, is um, we have to be mindful. And I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Look, we, we really have to be mindful of seeing like um, the truth behind the accusations and the allegations and, and, and that kind of thing, because um, I myself have been involved in a scandal in a, in a way that was very uncomfortable for me, but um, there were some distorted there was some in distorted information as a part of the whole thing. And I, I, I've heard this and I've seen this from, from a lot of people is that like riding the wave of the me too movement, uh, the me too movement and whatnot um, can make it very easy for, for people to get attacked by other people who are just angry at them, yeah. you know, for maybe not. So like we have to be very discerning in that. Um, but when there's an overwhelming amount of evidence and, and, you know, support of this thing, like we, we also have to be diligent in taking action, uh, as a species, as a, you know, as a collective, as a society to be able to, to, you know, right the wrongs or to heal things or to, to do, to do the work. And I think it's not just, you know, yes, Epstein should have gone to jail and all of that, you know, should have been prosecuted and uh, all of that sort of thing. But like the, you know, for the people who have been abused, it, you know, 
it's not going to end with, oh, he went to jail. It's got to end with them like completely doing all of the deep inner work to resolve within themselves and heal everything that's going on or that, that happened to them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Fully agreed. And I think it's another circumstance where it's both. And, you know, I think mm. so many things, I think I almost feel like my, one of my greatest spiritual mantras is both. And <laughs> it's <laughs> both a good and. one. Yeah. And it, it all comes down to that, that discernment and paying attention to what, what feels true for us. Instead of getting, I think right now is a, it's, it's a time that we could easily get like swirled into things, you know, especially with like the Q movement and the anti-Q movement. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's very swirly. Um, so I think that's, that's why it's, it's so good to just stay super in your body and, and listening to, to your deeper inner truth. And I'm sorry to hear that you went through that. Um, I'm sure, you know, Anyone that is stepping out in a powerful way, you know, shining their light, speaking truth, um, you know, it's, we inherently will trigger other people at some point. <laughs> I mean, um, people will project onto you. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's important to take into consideration as well. And I think it's really beautiful when, when things like that happen and then both parties can look at their stuff. Um, and own their stuff and there can be a healing instead of just like, you know, some crazy chaotic rift. Um, so yeah. Mm, definitely. Well, and even for myself, like, again, we're not getting into all the details of like everything that happened, but the, the whole bottom line of it for me was that it compelled me to learn, uh, so much more about this whole thing, about everything that's happening. And, uh, and why it's happening and where the rift is and like where that rift was within me. What, what was it within me that even created the space for, uh, you know, a con you know, this whole thing to have to come out in the first place. And, um, and that really helped me grow as a person. Like I was told I was going through a really rough one time in an ayahuasca ceremony. Uh, cause I've, you know, I was, yeah, doing a lot of healing work and, and this is, was coming up and I had one of the shamans come over and he's like, dude, I see everything you're going through right now. And like one day you're going to be grateful that it happened because it's compelled so much growth and, and, and evolution for you in ways that you couldn't even possibly imagine. And uh, that, I mean, I had a hard time seeing it at the time, right? Because in the space as you're going through this, um, but like that's still an emerging reality, I think, of like not being regretful of all of the things that happened, you know, like just owning my story and being the highest version of myself, the highest expression of my soul that I can possibly be. And I think that's probably, you know, for, for people, cause there's a lot of people out there, you know, if they're not high profile people and they've made some big mistakes or have done things that aren't as, you know, genuinely truthful, loving and authentic in every way. Um, it, it might seem like they can just get away with things cause they're not in a high profile position. And um, to be able to remember that there's nothing that escapes the eyes of God or the eyes of spirit or the, you know, the mind of the cosmos. And that like you are ultimately in that driver's seat that you can create the healing within you. And that creates a space for healing for everybody as, if you just open up to it. You know, um, I think that's that's a message that not a lot of people often hear. And maybe we need to say it a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. I, I fully resonate with that. And, um, yeah, and it comes back to humility because I think <laughs> we have to be humble to, to look at all that. I did, um, I do a lot of inner parts healing work, you know, sort of like gestalt therapy. And there was this one time where I, you know, I gave my younger self what she really, you know, didn't have, right. Like what, what she really needed. And, um, I was in this beautiful home and this loving mother and you know, just like laugh and cuddle in bed and um, whatever it was, I was just like so supported and so nourished, you know? And I was like, okay, so what would my life look like if I, if that was my life? And I actually just fast forwarded and um, just saw, you know, what I would have created with that life. And, and I got, this was like a full down, like this wasn't just my imagination. This actually would have been the timeline. And, you know, I would have stayed in Minnesota. Um, I would have been like 
a socialite and an artist, but with really no depth, just sort of, it would have been fun and sweet. And I didn't seek out my soul family because I was so nourished by my blood family. And I got to actually be like, oh my God, like, I actually would choose this, even though it felt like hell for so long. I actually am grateful for it because, you know, it's, it has put me here. And I think that's like a saying, you know, I'm grateful for what I went through because it got me to where I am. Like, that's a saying and it sounds like great. And like, I don't know, it could be bypassy, but if, if you could really feel that, like, and have that perspective, um, it's, it's actually profound to be able to see the difference and actually go, yep, still would have chosen it. Um, so I love that you brought that up. Yeah. yeah. And like, likewise, that was really, that was really deep. That was really good. Um, I've, I've often, I don't know, that was a thought in my mind. I don't know, maybe it was caused by some show or entertainment or maybe a book I read or something, but I had that, that question come up a lot in the last like month or two of being like if you could instantly try to like time travel right now go back to like right when you had your first spiritual awakening or whatever but like bring all of your memories back with you you know and then do it all again would you do it and how would it be different and um that just became like a whole swirl i had to let it go eventually but i don't know i it's not, it's not, a lot of pitfalls could be avoided, you know? Um, but like at the same time, like the amount of growth and, and, and what I've experienced here and now, like where I've, you know, come from and, and everything that's happened that's made me into the man I am now, I'll, I'll, even with all the struggle, as you said, like it's, it all added up, you know, in a, in a good way. So yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and and I like to um, I like to reference back to for a while I um, was reading a lot of case studies of of people under hypnosis that would go um, basically through the death of a past life into their higher self or even just you know under hypnosis into the wisdom of the higher self and um, now I do this every day in session I realize you don't actually hypnotherapy to do it but what was really beautiful at the time this is when I was just first researching all these things you know there would be these people that um are from society's perspective just screwing everything up right like depressed can't hold a job like poor addiction like screwing everybody over in their lives and it was so cool to see that when they tap into their higher self that they're actually doing exactly what they came here to do. They're learning the exact lessons they're coming to learn. They're in perfect divine timing. And it's so humbling for me as, um, as having a, a relative um, in addiction to really surrender to their path and that their path might be perfect and that they're a sovereign being and i may not understand it you know from the human level or the the human perspective um but that like on a, a cosmic level like it's okay um and and really not to judge and to do the best that i can to really support and and uplift but really s surrender yeah yeah yeah, well, there's a, I love that. Actually, I really love that because one, it's just grounded so much in just heart-centered awareness, just like this, you, you know, that we, we, we often, the spiritual community often says like unconditional love. And then it's like, oh, but the pedophiles and the rapists, they, you know, burn in hell, you know, and, and um, it's like, that's a good question. Can you, like, what would Jesus do? You know, what would that, that Christ consciousness do approaching the worst people in the world sort of thing. Like, how would they respond? Worst people, of course, I'm just, you know, using the term lightly. But the, the you know, the question then is, is, can we hold a space for even for their healing too? Like, I was wondering, um, like, if, if, if humanity evolved to this point, I think we could really get here and it would be really probably very powerful. But I don't know if we're quite there yet, but it's basically like our prison system when people are, go to jail, 
they should be offered the opportunity to do like very deep work with like plant medicine, you know, like have like ayahuasca shamans in, if they, you know, you'd have to probably have a very controlled, you know, having people making sure that, you know, they're not going to attack the shaman or anything like that, you know, if things go crazy. Um, so there's probably be, have to, you'd, have, you'd probably have to ask the medicine how to set those up right. But like for someone who has been suffering to the point where they are abusing other people, you know, in such a horrible way, murders and, and rapists and everything like that. Like, could humanity come to the point where we can have so much, just so infinite compassion that we can offer them the opportunity to heal themselves, to heal that darkness within them instead of just making a spectacle out of them and just saying, this is, an, this is a terrible person. What if we, because there's a whole story actually. There's like an old parable about like some old village a long time ago and there was like this guy in the village who killed a child and that the entire village tied up the, the, the murderer in the middle of the village and then one by one, every person in the village went up to this person and told them how beautiful they were because because they must have forgotten if they were if they had the capacity to kill a child they must have forgotten that they are a beautiful divine light inside and that was just such a like a, a beautiful story but then the question is like you know looking at where we are what what is it going to take to get for humanity to get to that point um and i think we've got many many, many lessons along the way to get there but it's a good idea i don't know Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And I heard, just a side note, um, your, I don't know if it's showing up on the recording or not, but the audio has started sort of um, being slightly staticky and, and kind of cutting in and out. So um, when I'm talking, if there's anything you feel called to shift. Um, but um, yes, and, and I heard also there was an, Af I don't know, maybe it's the same tribe, um, but there's an African tribe that um, Basically, when the mom is pregnant with the child, she will hear the song of the soul. And at any time when, when that being starts to go out of alignment, they'll sing that song, like their soul song to help them to remember to come back. And it also reminds me of the, um, are you familiar with Dr. Len and the Ho'oponopono prayers and, and his story with the psych ward? Not all of, not the story. I'm familiar with Ho'oponopono. Okay. So his story is that he, basically there was a psych ward that was going insane. Um, like all the employees were quitting and um, they couldn't keep anybody there. People were getting hurt and they had to lock people up. And basically um, they're running out of people to work there. So they got in touch with this man, this Hawaiian man, Dr. Len, and he's a really alternative form of therapist where he uses the ancient Ho'oponopono techniques. And so he said, I'll come in, but I'm not going to, you know, do traditional therapy. And so they said, yeah, whatever, just do what you can. So he came in and, and what he did was basically look at the people's files and do the whole Pono Pono prayers, basically cleansing his perception of those people, and um, and and knowing that we're you know part of this um, interconnected grid. And when I heal my perception of you, that actually helps you to heal. And within months, people were healing. Um, and within four years, they shut the whole place down because they didn't need anymore. People were, were healing and, and leaving. Um, so I, yeah, it's such an important key piece that we are missing as a society and, and just giving up on people rather than realizing that it's just their behavior is just a result of their environment, of the trauma that they went through. And, and it's the same with um, one of my clients. Actually, I, I coach a lot of therapists because they know there's, like, there's, there's something missing to that work. But one of my clients, she's so passionate, and she says that, you know, most therapists, they'll coach little kids or they'll, they'll you know, have therapy to little kids, but forgetting about, you know, the family. And the fact is that the child is just whatever their behavior is that's not okay. It's just bringing to light the dysfunction in the family. So you actually, you do a much better job by, you know, really helping the whole family to heal. And it's, it's just like taking responsibility for the, the cause and effect and, and actually going to the root, right? Instead of just 
yeah, giving up on them. I'm, I'm so with you on that. Yeah. I've been, I've been talking a lot lately and just, well, cause I, I'm talking a lot about this subject and, and going deep into the work of um, Dr. Bruce Lipton and the biology of belief. Cause that's, I mean, he, he shows that like, just like from, from conception to, you know, age six, seven, eight, children don't even they're not even cognitively thinking about things on their own they're just sponging in information from the environment so if it's a crappy environment i mean we wonder why they're suffering uh and i think they're, they're the one challenge that that we, we seem to be facing with the shifting of this awareness i guess maybe part of it is you know like the just the, the feminine mindset the feminine understanding um of that there is sort of this you know one consciousness or one mind or uh you know one awareness that sort of moves through everybody and everything like like thoughts are not isolated to your to your to your head you know they your thoughts and feelings extend beyond you in fields um and rupert Sheldrake has actually like done a lot of science to to show that you know to to, to demonstrate that and put forth some really good theories on it and like um I think people are maybe are just so attached to their identity that I am this, I am Jordan and I am, you know, this 29 years old and I have this job and I do this and I do that, whatever it is that people believe and about themselves. And that like, if they stopped to look at this whole, even just what you're saying, like a child's personality is sculpted by its environment, then our sense of self who we identify as is not even ours. And the moment that we like can let that go, that's where that humility comes in. That's where that receptivity comes in. We can suddenly just relax into a much more expansive version of ourselves because we open to becoming so much more than we than the limited version of ourselves that we're attached to. Yeah, exactly. And so, I love sharing this because I feel like it's something that, that not a lot of people talk about or really understand. So, you know, I get to find all that stuff that's like stored in the body and in and, and the energy body and the subconscious and whatever the program is, like we can find exactly what that is. And I would say like a third of the work is releasing energy that's not ours, <laughs> whether it be ancestral or from past partners or hooks and cords of people or, um, you know, belief systems that came from our parents or even absorbing their, you know, our, our parents' emotions. Um, and a lot of times taking these things on are our own coping mechanisms. It's how we stayed safe. Okay, so I wasn't safe to be you know, a bright shining star seed, it was safer to feel depressed like my dad, you know, in my family unit. And then right. you know, this person grows up with codependent patterns of taking on other people's um, negative emotions and their problems to stay safe because that's what helped them stay safe in their, in their childhood. So I think it's, it's really important in like sort of the next level of, of healing and psychology to really understand um, you know, release what's not yours. You, you know, it's safe to let it go now. Um, yeah, it's, I'm so passionate about that, that part. That was so beautifully said. Wow. I, I mean, I just have to say, Naya, this has just been an absolutely amazing call. Uh, I love you so much. I love your work. I, and like just connecting with you over this call, I think like you have so much to offer and so much to add. So um, as we, you know, just like, I mean, just, just to the world, to people on one-on-one, -on -one, and um, I think we're gonna start wrapping it up here, but, but before we do, like, if anybody uh, listening to this, they wanna connect with you and, you know, learn about you, find your work. Um, I don't know if you have like a, a YouTube channel as well or anything, but like for your website, can you share just like where people can find you and tune in? Yeah, thank you. Um, Facebook, I share quite a lot on Facebook and Instagram. Both are just Naya Lee. Um, Instagram is Naya.Lee. And I have a, a few videos on YouTube. Um, I might expand that at some point. Um, but yeah, and my website, NayaLee.com. And the, the connecting website, uh, BoundlessMethod.com, is, is the energy psychology method that I use and teach too. So. Mm, thank you so much. 
This has been an absolute pleasure and we'll have to, I, I'm looking forward to the next time we do this. Likewise. Yeah, I so appreciate it and I really enjoyed the conversation. So thank you so much. Yeah, mm, and thank me you too. everybody that, that's listening awesome. as well. 